So, yeah, so good afternoon. I'm sorry I'm a bit late. So, <clears throat> we were, uh, had started to talk about morphisms. And um, so, it first talked about uh, regular functions, which were <coughs> functions which were uh, locally given as quotients of polynomials. And then we had defined uh, morphisms in general as uh, continuous maps which are compatible with uh, regular functions. So that means that if we have a regular function on an open subset, and we take uh, the pullback of this regular map, that is the composition with the morphism, uh, then this is a, a regular function on the inverse image of this open subset. And uh, <clears throat> now we wanted to come to uh, give some more concrete description of morphisms, because this definition is a little bit abstract. <clears throat> And so um, I first wanted to talk about morphisms uh, to subvarieties of AN. So if you want to find varieties. So, <clears throat> and here the statement is that they are given by an n tuple of regular functions. So if uh, theorem, uh, so let uh, x and y be varieties, and we assume that y is a subvariety of n, um, so a map phi from x to y is a morphism if it is given by an uh, n-tuple of regular functions which are regular on the whole of x. So if that exists, if and only if, There exist, um, say, F1 to Fn, which are regular functions on the whole of X, um, such that uh, we have uh, E of P is equal to F1 of P until N of P for all P in X. So we can then also write uh, phi is just F1 to Fn. Okay, so this is uh, this is characteristic characterization of morphisms, so subvarieties of An. So, uh, for instance, if X itself is a um, uh, and a fine variety, a closed subvariety of some AM, then these FI have to be elements of the coordinate ring. Because we had this theorem. Oh, okay. X of X is then equal to AX. So, proof. So we have uh, if and only if, we have to show both directions. So first we take a morphism, phi from x to y, be a morphism. So we somehow have to get these fi. And uh, if you think of it, you know, they are just the, you know, if you compose phi with the coordinates, on a n, this will give us the fi. So let's see. So <clears throat> um, let y1 to y n uh, 
uh, be the restrictions of the coordinates. on an to y. So, so if I call the, I mean, if I call the coordinates uh, on this an, if I call them maybe also y1 to an, I could denote by the same letter the restriction to y, which is now a regular function on the whole of y, because it's a restriction of a polynomial. Yeah, so we have gotten some regular functions here. And, um, <clears throat> you know, note, I mean, this is duality, but I want to keep it in mind. So if you have a point Q equals to A1 to An in Y, we can write it, this, the ith coordinate is just obtained by applying yi to q. No? That's just you know, the i coordinate. So um, now we put fi, we are supposed to produce these reg functions regularly. Well, we define them to be the pullback of the yi. So in other words, yi composed with phi. And uh, as this is a morphism, these are regular functions on the whole of x, because the y i were regular functions on the whole of y. So <clears throat> now I have to see that this does this kind of trivially. So if we take a point p and x, then we can write phi of p equal to, so somehow it will be some points, b1 to bn, where the bi are the, where the bi are just the yi of phi of p. No, this is just the ith coordinate of phi of p. And so this is just equal to fi of p. So if set it up in such a way, that indeed it is true. OK. <clears throat> so you just have to see that the, the components of the map are in a natural way the pullbacks of the coordinates. And therefore, then it's clear that these will be regular functions. So now we have to do the other direction. So, <clears throat> so conversely, we assume we are given phi in this form. So let phi from equal to f1 to fn uh, with fi in ox of x be a map. So from, so this is a map from uh, x to y. And this notation means as before that phi of p is, is equal to f1 of p to fn of p. This is certainly a well-defined map. No? Just we say what the coordinates of the map are. And uh, we require that it goes from x to y. I mean, this is, doesn't know before, but we assume that. And so now we have to see that this is indeed a morphism according to our definition. Because uh, you know, we have defined what a morphism is. You know, it's, it's supposed to be continuous, and the pullback of regular functions should be regular. And so let's see. So to show phi is a morphism.
So let's see. So first we have to show it's continuous. So the inverse image of closed subsets is closed. So let B subset X be closed. That is, we can write B equal to X intersected the zero set of some polynomials. With GI some polynomial in K X1 to Xn. Now we know the closed subsets are of this form because it's a risky topology. So, so let G be one of the GI. Somehow want to describe the inverse image of B, so we want to describe how the zero set of uh, B composed with G composed with phi is. So we can write G somehow it's a polynomial, so sum I1 to IN, A I1 to IN, X1 to the I1 until Xn to the In. So somehow it is a polynomial. So what is now G composed with phi? Well, phi is given by uh, component-wise by uh, taking uh, the ith component is fi. So if I compose it with, if I compose g with this, it means precisely that I have to replace uh, the xi by the fi. So this is just sum i1 to n Also, we could also say it's G of F1, Fn. And um, now you see this is a linear combination of products of the Fi's um, with coefficients in K. And um, uh, this Fi itself is an element of Ox of X. So this whole expression is also an element of O of X, of X because this is a K-algebra. Okay, what? I think this subset Y is just a... Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I uh, lost... Uh, check of, uh, so the target is y, so therefore it is y here and it is y here. Okay. So, um, let's see. So, and, um, so, <clears throat> Therefore, if I take phi to the minus 1 of b, this is just the zero set of uh, uh, g1 composed with phi, gn. What is it? G, I put it n, but it's maybe gm composed with phi. So the common, and we know that the zero set, this is an element of Ox of x. And we know a zero set of an element of x of x is closed. And so it's the intersection of these closed uh, sets. So we know z of gi is closed in x. So this thing will be closed in x. So therefore, the map is 
uh, continuous inverse image of a closed subset is closed. Then finally, we have to see that it's compatible with regular functions on open subsets. Well, so we have to write down any regular function and have to see what it is. What? So, so the pre-image is the set of all uh, p and x such that p of p is an element in uh, p. Which is and b is equal to z of of g one or g n. So this is equal to the set of all p and x, such that if I take g i composed with phi, it is zero. Maybe with a bracket. <coughs> so now we want to um, come to, we want to show it's compatible with regular functions and open subsets. So we take, um, so let H be a regular function on an open subset u of y and say we write w, w to be the inverse image of u. So we have to show that uh, h composed with phi is regular on this. Now, we had this before, that we are always allowed, when we want to check uh, um, that something is regular, we are always replaced to, uh, allowed to replace an open subset by a smaller open neighborhood of any point in this open subset. So we can always make this open subset smaller. But you know, we might then need several open subsets for one here, because, but for every point, we have to be able to find an open neighborhood for which whatever we want to prove is true. And we always use this in a way, in the way that we can assume that our regular function is a quotient of polynomials. No? Because we know that locally a regular function is a quotient of polynomials. And so we will do this again. So replacing u by uh, a smaller neighborhood of any given point of any, say, p in u, we can assume that, um, uh, say, h of q is equal to f of q divided by g of q for all in U, where F and G are some um, polynomials, and G has no zero on U. And now, what happens if we take H composed with phi? H composed with phi is F composed with phi divided by G composed with phi. That is, according to what we've seen here, we just take F 
and replace the variables by f1 to fn and the same with g. And so if we, we have just seen that if we take a polynomial and we put into it regular functions like this, we get regular functions. So this is a regular function and this is a regular function. are regular on the whole of x. And uh, g of f1 to fn has no 0. Uh, well, actually, we're not on the whole of x. Uh, we have a, I mean, wherever we were. So we were on u, no? o x w. And uh, we had seen that if we are in u, then g of a point P in U is not zero. And the points of W all map into U. So it means that G of F1 to Fn has no zero on W. So by the result we proved the other time, we know that if we have a quotient of two uh, regular functions such that the uh, denominator has no zero on the corresponding open set, then uh, this quotient is also regular. Okay, and so this shows that this is indeed a morphism. And so, um, so anyway, you see that in order to get this relation, we just have to see that the coordinates the self, them, themselves on the target in AN are regular functions, and that we can define the regular functions which give us uh, these, which define us the map in terms of the coordinates just as a pullback of the coordinates, and then we don't just have to check the definitions. Okay. <coughs> So, so, in particular, we get what we had before in special case. So, if uh, so, the the regular functions on a variety X are the same. as the morphisms from x to a1, because this is the special case of having one variable. You know, it just says that the coordinate of uh, the map, and there's only one, must be a regular function. And um, I also mentioned this before, that um, um, so if I have uh, two a fine variety, so two closed varieties of sub-varieties of a, a, n, and a, m, then the morphisms between them are precisely the polynomial maps. The closed sub-varieties So then the morphisms P from X to Y are precisely the polynomial maps. So this is because uh, we have just proven that if we have a morphism from anything to y, it's given by an n, and in this case, an m tuple of regular functions, which are regular on the whole of x. And um, now uh, we know that if x itself is a closed subvariety of an, then the 
the functions which are regular on the whole of X are precisely the elements of AX of the coordinate ring. And a polynomial map is one which is given by an n-tuple of uh, uh, elements in the polynomial ring, which is the same as given by an n-tuple of polynomials. Okay. So it's um, <clears throat> this is uh, straightforward. So we can also have a kind of more abstract algebraic description of that to say that somehow talking about morphisms of uh, uh, sub-varieties of a n and dm is the same as talking about homomorphisms of k-algebras. So, um, so this is, um, this is, you know, rather, I mean, we are not going to use it so very much, but it's rather important when one goes to more advanced uh, uh, topics in algebraic geometry that somehow um, this somehow leads to the generalizations that one makes there when one talks about schemes and so on. So, but uh, here we just have the statement. So let X and Y be varieties and assume Y in the N is a closed subvariety. There's a bijection. Uh, so we can look at the morphisms from X to Y. Is in bijection to the K algebra homomorphisms from, in this case, from EY to OX of X. And the map is uh, the obvious one to a morphism phi. We associate the pullback by phi. No, just the composition with this. We know that if uh, phi is a morphism, then the pullback by it is a homomorphism of K algebras like that, that we had seen. And the claim is that if we know this K algebra homomorphism, we also know the morphism. <laughs> and all K algebra homomorphisms come about in this way. So I will not give a complete proof of this. It's not very difficult. I will just, I will construct the inverse map. And then one has to check that it is indeed the inverse. That's somehow the most difficult part. You have to see if you have such a homomorphism, how from that do you get? the morphism back. But in some sense, it's very similar to what we already did. <laughs> so proof. So first, so I mean, I can just say if phi from x to y is a morphism, then we know phi star from a y so O X of X is a K algebra homomorphism. This is clear. And now we want to construct the inverse map. Define inverse map. So we have to start with a K algebra homomorphism. So let phi from a y to a x of x be a k algebra homomorphism. We want to construct uh, a kind of phi of which it was the pullback, a small phi. So how do we do this? So we do in some sense what we already did because we know that somehow the, you know, it's kind of clear what the pullback of the coordinates, I mean, that the coordinates play a role and they're, they're pullback. So let, say, y1, so yn, in ay be the coordinate function.
So in other words, you know, we have the coordinates, if you want, x1 to xn on, on this. Uh, well, actually, it should be m, no? because we are in am. We have the coordinates here, and we just restrict them to y. They become functions on y. And um, if we have, we have somehow seen that before we could describe morphisms in terms of the pullbacks of the coordinate functions. So we take the pullbacks. So that fi um, phi, I mean, this is supposed to be the pullback. So if I take phi of yi, this will be then some element in Ox of x. And we put the, the map given by these coordinates, by these functions. So the, co the point P is set to this M2. Now, this is certainly a map which is defined on X. If I take a point P in X, I send it to somewhere. But a priori, it only goes to, uh, we have to see, to AM. No? Because we haven't yet, you know, we would want to say it's a map from X to Y. But, you know, if we just write down something like that, we don't know whether it, all, the point, all the points of X lie, lie in Y. We have to check that. So we want... Uh, so, so we have that. Huh? So then, this is a morphism. So we have constructed a morphism, of which we still might want. To, however, we want to have a morphism to Y and not just to AN. To, so to see, it is a morphism. y, we have to see that all the points of x are mapped to y. We had seen the last time that if we have a morphism to a larger variety, which actually maps to a subvariety, then, then viewed as a map to the subvariety, it's also morphism. So therefore, it's, only, it's enough to check that. Well, and so how we do, do we do that? Well, we take an, uh, a polynomial in the ideal of y, and we see that it's, a, uh, that it's inverse, it, its pullback vanishes on x, which will be what we need. So let h be an element in the ideal of y. So, if I take H composed with phi, this is H of F1 to Fm. No, we had seen this before, no, that we, the composition is uh, done by putting this into it. So the coordinates are replaced by these functions Fi. And this is h. So according to this, so fi is phi of uh, the small yi. But, uh, <coughs> but as phi is a k-algebra homomorphism, we can pull the phi out. So this is phi of h of y1 to ym. But, you know, yi, the yi are the coordinate functions. So this is, uh, if I maybe write large yi, the coordinates on, uh, on, on uh, a m, this is yi restricted to y. So it's the coordinates of AM restricted to Y. 
or it's, if you want, it's the class of the coordinates on the M modulo the ideal of Y. But so, these, what we have inside here is the class of the YI modulo the ideal of Y, but H lies in the ideal of Y. So that means if we apply H to this, we actually get zero. Okay. So what we find is that H composed with phi is zero. So that means that uh, uh, <clears throat> if we take the image of X, this is in the zero set of H. And so H was a general element of I of Y, that is the phi of X is contained in the zero set of the ideal of, X, of Y. So A, <coughs> so phi of X is contained in Y. So we have indeed found in this way a morphism from phi from X to Y. And then you know, one wants to check that this is inverse. So, so show, so this, I just go on exercise, show these two maps. So phi maps to phi star and uh, phi maps to this thing which I here just called phi. which are inverse to each other. So for instance, if we take start with phi star, if we do this construction, we should get back the phi. I mean, this maybe I should uh, I mean, it's not anyway. And on the other hand, if we, uh, we should also see that uh, <coughs> Uh, I mean, they are in, that it's an inverse in both directions, so that we get the, in the one. And you know, this is both uh, pretty straightforward to check. You know, you have it uh, he, now. Everything is written down, and you just have to check that it's the same thing. Okay. So I. <clears throat> want to use this as an example to see that uh, there are, um, that you can have a bijective polynomial map which is not an isomorphism. You know, one could have thought that if a map is bijective and a morphism, then it is an isomorphism, but that's not the case. So example, bijective polynomial map need not be an isomorphism. So um, we have this cuspidal cubic, so C is equal to the zero set of Y squared minus X to the three in A2. And so the, if you just look at the real points, uh, this uh, we had this picture before. It somehow looks like this. Well, it's symmetric, but you know, anyway. And here we have the point zero. And uh, <clears throat> so the claim is that this we have a bijective morphism from a one to this, which is not an isomorphism. So you can somehow imagine if this is a one. I just look at the real points, then you can somehow project here, and this will be a bijective morphism. Or rather, maybe it's, I uh, don't know which way it now goes, yeah. You can kind of parameterize it like this, but which would correspond to both. So this will be a projective morphism. Then the question is whether you can also go back. So, and the claim is 
that you can't. So we have um, phi equal to, actually I didn't give the map correctly. Well, anyway, phi equal to t squared t to the 3 from, um, so we want to somehow parametrize it. Uh, this goes from um, A1 to C is a morphism. So you can, you know, it's obviously morphism because it's a polynomial map. It's given by polynomials. And um, it, you can easily see that it does map to C because uh, if you have, a, if this first coordinate is, if, if this is equal to T squared, and this is equal to T to the three, then we will get zero. And uh, it's actually easy to see that it is bijective. In fact, I can, one can give the inverse map. And the inverse How is it? So now we take two points here. Uh, so a point with two coordinates. So I say the inverse I call G from C to A1. So I take G of AB. is defined to be um, B divided by A. Obviously, if A is different from 0. And uh, which means if the point is not zero, zero. And I put it zero uh, for AB. Okay. So you see at least from this definition, it's not obvious that uh, this would, could be described as a polynomial map. It doesn't look very much like it. Um, <clears throat> but you know, in theory, it could still be there would be another way to write it. I mean, anyway, you can see that this is the inverse if you just, uh, put, uh, you know, look what happens if you have, uh, you know, you get, you know, if uh, A is T to the third and A is T squared and B is T to the third, uh, then B divided by A will be T. No, not very surprisingly, so you get it back and also works in the other direction. And uh, the, the point, uh, you know, the only point where the f first coordinate is zero is the point zero, zero. So you can also complete it like this. So, but I claim this is not a morphism. So, so phi is not an isomorphism. In other words, G is not a morphism. Well, for instance, we can see it like that. <coughs> Um, ah, yeah. I forgot something, but now I first finish it and then we will see. This we could also have seen earlier, at any rate. So, um, because if we look at phi star from A of C to uh, KXY, so which is KXY modulo uh, Y squared minus X to the three, it's not completely obvious, but I claim that the ideal of C is the ideal generated by this thing. So, the pullback goes to KT. And um, so, so what is the pullback? Well, the element X is mapped to the composition with this map. So to the first coordinate here, so T squared. So it maps X to T squared and Y to T to the third. 
And you see, phi star is not an isomorphism. In clearly, because it is not surjective. So one polynomial, which is obviously not in the image, is t. No? If it's not constant, then at least we have to have a t squared. We had seen earlier, we were not actually using now this result we just proved, we had seen uh, the previous time that if we have a, a morphism and have an isomorphism, then uh, the, uh, the map on uh, global regular functions is an isomorphism. The pullback on regular functions is an isomorphism. And uh, here it isn't. Okay? So phi is not an isomorphism. I mean, if one believes in this picture, one also maybe wouldn't want this to be counted as an isomorphism because they don't look so very similar. No? We do have some point here which is very special, this cusp. And uh, we also can see that uh, it's precisely that point where it goes wrong because obviously on this, on the open set where we leave out the zero, this is a, is a morphism, the inverse map, because it's a quotient of two regular functions and the denominator is non-zero. But at this point, it fails to be a morphism and it cannot be made into one. Okay. So now, yeah, we wanted to um, somehow, uh, now we, we had defined to be an affine variety to be a, a variety which is isomorphic to a closed subvariety of A n. Now one could think, think that this is still the same as the closed subvarieties of A n, but in fact it's not the case. For instance, one thing that can happen is that you have a close that you take an open subset of a closed subvariety of A n, and it's still affine. So it's isomorphic to a closed subvariety in some other affine space. And that's actually quite, again, it's not so, uh, maybe it doesn't look so exciting, but it's very useful uh, later because it somehow implies the fact that if you have any variety, any, any point on any variety, it has a neighborhood which is affine. And so if you want to prove anything about varieties, uh, which you can prove by proving it locally, you, can only, you only have to prove it for affine varieties. And that is actually uh, something which uh, the more advanced one is in the subject, the more often one does it that way. Okay, we are not going to use it so much, but uh, it uh, is an important fact. Although here it looks a little bit, you know, not so exciting. Anyway, so <clears throat> let x, so I first define, let x in an be a closed subvariety. And we take f some polynomial. In this a n, and then, so which does not, uh, you know, con so, so maybe does not lie in the idea of x. It doesn't vanish on the whole of x. Uh, then, the principal open defined by f is uh, xf, which is just defined to be x without the zero set of f. So that we can certainly define. But the claim now is uh, 
xf is always is in a fine variety. So if we take any closed subvariety of a n and we take the complement of a hypersurface, it will always be a fine. Okay, so in fact, you can find it as a closed subvariety in a n plus one. So let's see. So we put that to be, so say, the zero set of the idea generated by the ideal of x and one more polynomial, which might remind you of the proof of the Nullstellensatz, x n plus 1 minus 1. So we have here one more variable, x n plus 1, and this is a zero set in a n plus 1. So we take the elements in the deal of x, we add one more equation in an extra variable, which says that. <coughs> and you know, as you can see here, this condition, if this thing vanishes, it means that f cannot be zero at that point. So somehow we will see that this thing will be isomorphic to xf. So show z is a closed subvariety of um, an plus one isomorphic to xf. Okay. So, so we can define a map from xf to, to n plus 1, which has this as an image. So let phi, I just write it down, x1 to xn. So the xi are just the coordinates on an. So this is kind of the identity on the first n coordinates. And then we have 1 over f. So this is a map from xf to n plus 1 is a morphism. So it's a morphism because it's given by an n tuple of regular functions. So the first coordinates, n plus 1 tuple, the first n are just the coordinates, and they are certainly regular. The last one is 1 over f. And this will be regular whenever f doesn't have a 0. But xf precisely contains of the, of the points of x where f is not 0. So 1 over f is regular on xf. Regular functions are in Okay, so, and I claim it also maps to that. And phi of xf is equal to z. Um, I think that's, uh, you know, that's easy to see that, uh, you know, <clears throat> if you just look, these are the points x1 to xn where the first n, co you know, if I look at z, this is, uh, z is the set of all points a1 to a n plus 1 in a n, where the first, where a1 to a n are a point in xf, and the last uh, a n plus 1 is equal to 1 over f of uh, the other ones. And this is precisely uh, the same as saying that it is the image of this map. Just by definition, the, it is this. And it's also clear, and it's clear that 
T is projective. I mean, the inverse map is just the projection to the first n coordinates. So <clears throat> now, um, so first, however, you know, in order to be, in principle, we have to first show that Z is a closed subvariety. So it's not a closed subset, just a closed subset, but it's also irreducible. And this follows uh, from this, because, um, so as xf is irreducible, also c is irreducible. Namely, um, you know, if I just write if uh, say z is equal to the union of two closed subsets, um, then uh, xf is the union of the inverse image of the zi's. And according, you know, as the zi are not equal to z, and the map is subjective, all the inverse images are not equal to xf. Also closed because phi is continuous. And so it would follow. So it would follow that uh, xf would be reducible. So, no, or in rather says we have this. So if we have this, then we have this is this. But we, we know this is not the case because xf is irreducible, so also z is irreducible. Incidentally, this argument obviously works in complete generality. I've just proven that if you have uh, in a morphism from uh, uh, some uh, variety to some other variety, then the image is always irreducible. And that's what this argument proves. Okay. So thus we find that Z is a closed subvariety of A n plus one. And uh, now we are allowed to talk about morphisms starting at z. And you know, we can see that phi to the minus one, which already had told you what it was, namely it's given by just the co projection to the first n coordinates. It is uh, also a morphism. So we find that indeed xf is isomorphic to z. Okay, so this was about this, uh, this thing. Now, so I had given some kind of description of the morphisms to uh, subvarieties of a fine space in terms of uh, kind of the coordinates of the morphism. Now we want to do something similar for morphisms between quasi-projective varieties. So again, we want to say that if we have a morphism, then its uh, components are either given by polynomials or by elements in the 
uh, or by regular functions. So let's see. this works. Maybe I first briefly talk about a special case. So morphisms of quartz projective varieties. So first, um, you know, I talk about polynomial maps, which I can also define for quartz projective algebraic sets. Definition at y in Pn, say x in Pn, y in Pn, Pm, uh, quasi projective algebraic sets. So a map. P from x to y is called a polynomial map if it's given by polynomials. What does it mean? If there exist polynomials, so f1 F0 to so Fm in K x0 to so Xn, so as many coordinates as the source, and as many of them as we have in target, uh, which are homogeneous of the same degree. And they have no common zero on x. So if you take the zero set of all of them, then this doesn't intersect x. Um, such that for all points p and x, we have p of p is equal to F0 of P until Fm of P. OK. So we write phi is equal to F0 to Fm. So again, the components of phi are polynomials. Then we call it the polynomial map. Um, so again, what I mean here is, you know, F0 of P you know, is not well defined. Well, we know this is just a polynomial. If we multiply P by some uh, non-zero constant, we get something else. Because, um, but but if we replace here P by any representative, a0 to an, and take the same representative for all of them, then if we you know, take another same representative for all of them, we get the same result, because the whole thing is only, you know, this class is only up to multiplying by the same constant. So this is well defined. OK. Um, yes. So, so um, anyway, so we can, you know, you can easily write down any example that you want. But, um, <clears throat> so, Turns out, <coughs> we'll see in a moment that uh, so these are morphisms which actually occur. So it does 
it often happens that morphisms between quasi-projective or projective algebraic sets are just given by uh, m tuples of polynomials. But um, uh, there are more morphisms because uh, to have a morphism, we actually only need that it's locally a polynomial map so that for each point in X, there's a neighborhood so that on that neighborhood it's given by an M tuple of polynomials. Okay, so it's a more general concept and this is really not good enough, but it is something, you know, this, the easier morphisms are like this. So uh, now before doing this, we want to first um, you know, study, uh, and this we anyway are going to use, you know, we, have, um, we have seen that AN is bijective to an open subset of PN, just this uh, uh, set which I called U0 or something. So we have a, this bijection. Now the claim is that it, this bijection is actually an isomorphism. So that you know, we really are allowed to identify AN with this open subset. And uh, so this will be quite useful. And this also will allow us to deduce this fact that we just said, that if um, uh, we have a morphism between a quasi-projective uh, varieties, then it's locally given by m tuples of polynomials. We, we deduce it from the fact that we have a similar statement for uh, subvarieties of a fine space. Once we have the statement that uh, open subset of that this uh, this u zero is isomorphic to a n. So let's see. So um, this is so we had defined. So an open cover of a n by open subsets u i from i equals zero to n, where u i is the set of all uh, a zero to uh, so n and p n such that AI is non-zero. If you want, you can then normalize AI to be one. Um, and we had shown, we had seen that we have a bijection uh, this was phi i from a n, you know, it's the other direction, from u i to a n, which sends a point uh, a zero to a n to uh, the corresponding quotient where every element is divided by a i and a i divided by a i is left out. So this is A0 divided by AI, and it goes on. When we arrive at AI divided by AI, we throw it away, and then we get to AN divided by AI. And the inverse was uh, UI from uh, a n to u i, which is obtained by taking an n tuple, which I write as a zero to a n, where however the ith one is not there, so it's just n instead of n plus one, and we uh, map it to the same thing, where in the ith position now we put one. but now obviously in projective space. So this we had seen, these, are, these two maps are obviously inverse to each other. And so u i is bijective, is in bijection to an a n. 
Now we want to show that phi i is an isomorphism. So that according to our defi definition of morphisms, we really can say that you know, there's no real difference between ui and an. We have an isomorphism between them. So we use, so to be an isomorphism, it's also a homeomorphism. So we have to be able to talk about uh, uh, continuity and relate uh, closed subsets and one the, and the other. And so one tool for this, we use for this is a dehomogenization. So definition. Um, so the de dehomogenization of a polynomial k0, k for k in x0 to xn, actually a homogeneous polynomial, but doesn't play a role in the definition, um, is just obtained by putting x0 equal to 1. And so if f was a homogeneous polynomial in x0 to xn, then this fa uh, will no longer necessarily be homogeneous, but it will have one variable less. OK. And so <clears throat> and we, we do this here because uh, if we take um, a closed subset in, uh, say, u0, then its inverse image in uh, an will be the, if it's a zero set of f, its inverse image will be the zero set of fa. And this will show us that uh, this is continuous. So let's see. So now we have this statement theorem. What? Well, uh, it's not, I mean, it's not really strictly necessary for defining this as homogeneous, but we'll only consider it when f is homogeneous. We can also say. So, I mean, if, uh, if, you know, we can always put uh, x0 equal to 1, whatever we have. But, it, it, you know, we are only considering homogeneous polynomials here, so we can assume that f is homogeneous. Okay, theorem. So maybe I will just do the first part. So if I take phi i from ui to an, the map that we just have had is an isomorphism. So let's see. So anyway, we will, <clears throat> so obviously, Whichever i we choose, the statement is the same. No, it's just a question of, uh, of which index we have here. So we can assume that i is equal to 0. So we just look at phi 0 from u0 to this. It's the same thing. And I just write phi. And uh, u. And u, so u zero. Okay. So now we have. Um, so what is phi? First, we want to see that phi is a morphism, but that's 
obvious because what is phi? Phi is just equal to x1 divided by x0 until xn divided by x0. Because after all, it's the map which sends a0 to n to uh, a1 divided by a0 until n divided by a0. So that's just this. And these xi divided by x0 is a polynomial, is a quotient of two polynomials of the same degree, obviously. Um, and the denominator does not vanish on u0. No? Because u0 is the point where then at first the zero coordinate is not zero. So these, this means that the x i divided by x zero is an element of is regular, is a regular function on uh, ui or u zero for all i. So thus it follows that phi is a morphism. Because we had said that if you have a map to any subvariety of some affine space, which is given by regular by an n tuple of regular functions, then it's a morphism. So that's the easy direction. Now, in order to find that phi is an isomorphism, we have to see that the inverse map is also a morphism. And now, unfortunately, we have to use a definition because that, you know, we don't have a criteria, criterion yet how to say, you know, by looking at the components whether something, whether a map to uh, projective space is a morphism. So let's just do it. So remember that U of um, a1 to an is equal to 1 a1 to an. So to be a morphism, it has to be first continuous. So first So that means we have to take a closed subset of um, u0 and show its inverse image under u is closed. So let w, which I can therefore write as z of f1 to fm intersected u, be closed in u. So where the fi are some homogeneous polynomials homogeneous okay now what is the inverse image under u of this so u to the minus 1 of w is what well, this is the set of all uh, uh, a1 to an in an such that if I apply u to it, I land in w. But u of this is just 1 a1 to an is in W or equivalent. So, okay. And to be in W means it's in the zero set of that. So, in other words, uh, this is equal to the set of A1 to An such that in the end, such that um, if I take fi of uh, uh, 1 a1 to an, this is equal to 0. So all i equals 1 
to m. No, this is the same as you know, as uh, w was a zero set of these polynomials. But this is nothing else than f i a of a one to n. No, that's after all how f a was defined, the dehomogenization. So in other words, we find that this is equal to the zero set of F1A until FMA. So it's closed in A. OK, so it's just a, um, this straightforward thing. And now um, the other thing we have to prove you know, to have uh, that it's a morphism, it must be compatible with uh, regular functions on open subsets. So we have to keep on going, going through the definition. So again, so let uh, V subset U be open and H be a regular function on V. We have to show you know, upper star of H is a regular function on uh, U to the minus one of V. No? Just that's what the definition says. So again, we do, you know, as always, we can, in order to, to check this, we can uh, make this V smaller. We just have to be able to check it on a neighborhood of any given point in V. And therefore, we can assume that H is a quotient of two polynomials, homogeneous of the same degree. So making V smaller, if necessary, We can assume that um, uh, H of Q is equal to F of Q divided by G, or maybe I write P, I don't have a P before. F of P divided by G of P for all P in V and the F and G are polynomials homogeneous of the same degree. Because we know that regular functions can locally be, be written as quotients of polynomials which are homogeneous of the same degree. <laughs> Well, now what is u upper star of h? So this is h composed with u. So this is f composed with u right by g composed with u. But we have seen, uh, I mean, we have been using that here. If we take f and compose it with u, this means we you know, send a1 to a n to 1 a1 to a n and put it into f. So that means we replace f by its dehomogenization and g by its dehomogenization. So this is just f a divided by g a. So we find that the pullback is again a quotient of two polynomials. And now on, on a fine space, to be a regular function, it has to be just a quotient of two polynomials locally, and the denominator must not be zero. But as it, it <coughs> so this is, um, and uh, G 
g a is not has no zero on um, u to the minus one of v, because after all, <laughs> the value of g a at the point in u to the minus one of v is just the value of v at the image point of g at the image point, and that was non-zero, after all. So it follows uh, new stage is indeed an element and phi uh, it follows therefore that phi uh, from a n to u is an isomorphism. Okay, this is what we wanted to show. Anything you can still say? Okay, so we we proved this. So um, so in particular, for instance, this says. In particular, we see that phi from u0 of mu phi to a n is a homeomorphism. No, it is an isomorphism, so it's a homeomorphism. So we see that uh, the uh, <coughs> so Thus, uh, if we use uh, zero to identify uh, an with an open subset with u zero in p n, we find that. The, uh, the usual Zariski topology on AN is just, I mean, it's just equal to the Zariski topology on U0, you know, the restriction, the induced topology from PN. So that uh, so that also does somehow seem to justify that we want to sometimes make this identification because it's really an isomorphism. You know, it's compatible with the structure we have. And um, so, uh, in particular, if um, X in the N is a closed subvariety. And we view an equal to u zero pn. We can take the closure of so the closure bar of x in pn is a projective variety, and it's called the projective closure of x. So, and in fact, um, there is a, so we, we can always, if we have a, uh, an affine variety, we can always consider its projective closure in PN. And I mentioned somehow that going from affine to projective space is somehow similar to compactification. So somehow, one can view this as saying, you know, at least intuitively, that 
if you have an, a fine variety, we always have a canonical way of compactifying by taking its closure in Tn. But I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, if you look at the Zariski topology, this is not the compactification. You know, the, the Zariski topology is so strange that um, this thing is already quasi compact, but it's never housed off. But in some suitable sense, you can still view it as a uh, compactification. For instance, if you are over the complex numbers and use the complex topology, then the affine variety will not be compact, but this one will be. Okay. Um, what else? Okay. And, um, you know, actually, here we had this dehomogenization. I wiped it out, but there's a way how to, you know, if you have a closed subset in Pn, you can dehomogenize it. You can, it's a zero set of some homogeneous polynomial. You put the first coordinate equal to zero, to one, to get a homogeneous polynomial. The zero set of that will be the intersection with the n. And you can also go the other way around to find the closure. That's a bit more complicated. So there's a way of homogenizing a polynomial by adding, multiplying by some power of x0. And then you find that uh, the, um, if x is a closed subvariety, you can, in terms of homogenization, define the, uh, you know, define x bar as a zero set of the homogenizations of the polynomials here. There's an exercise to that effect in the notes. Uh, okay. But maybe that's enough now. Next time we will uh, continue with these morphisms.